Dears, welcome back. The program is continue with Sejin. In this part, I would like to invite Professor Namık Kemal Aras, Professor Zahurul Karim, to the present Rafael Guerrero. <laughs> Professor Rafael Guerrero, we are waiting to stage you, please. <coughs> Go ahead. Yes. I will make short introduction of uh, Professor Rafael Guerrero. He is academician of National Academy of Sciences of Philippines, and uh, his main field, the fishery management in applied zoology, and he is also. <clears throat> yes. Major activities, if you look at him, uh, is first of all president of Filipino uh, Philippine Fisheries uh, Society. I think that maybe we should eat fish tonight and we will have information from him, you know, so he knows fishes very well. That's right, we did not yes, get yes. fish yesterday. <laughs> yes. Uh, uh, he, at the moment, uh, Professor Lecturer. School of Environment Sciences and Management. He has uh, many honor and awards that I don't want to go all of them, but one of them is that Outstanding Filipino Award. That is one of the first one in the Philippine countries. And also that award for science and technology, and also one of the 10 outstanding young men of the Philippines. At the time, he was young, but time. still young, you know, so. <laughs> okay, go ahead, please. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Professor Aras, Professor Karim. It's, it's, a, it's an honor and pleasure to be here in Istanbul. Since my high school days, I've always heard about this beautiful and uh, historic city, you know, uh, being a Christian. Yeah, and I'd like to thank uh, the uh, Tuba for uh, inviting me and supporting me as well. My presentation will be about uh, sustainable freshwater aquaculture for food security so you can see that. in rural Asia. I'll try to keep within but my time yeah, yeah. Uh, limit. I think everybody knows the importance of freshwater in uh, our yeah. world today. It's one of the most essential natural resources that is limited. We see seas all around us, but I think uh, you will find out that 97% of this is salty and not potable or drinkable. About 3% only of our waters are fresh water from the surface, underground, or even in the air. Fresh water is vital for life and survival. I think we need at least two liters a day to, to keep us alive. But to provide us with washing, you know, bathing, and other things, uh, domestically, we need about 50 liters per person. So if there are about 7 billion people on, this planet, you multiply that by 50 liters, you can imagine the amount of water we need to conserve or manage. Well, the uses of water are well known, but we should know that most of it is used for food production, agriculture, especially for Asia, uh, in which 86% of the water in Asia is used for agriculture. It takes about 5,000 liters to produce one liter, oh, I'm sorry, one kilo of rice. Okay. I don't know about wheat. I don't think wheat needs as much water. Domestic use of water, as I already mentioned, for drinking, washing, and other things. Okay. Even industries need water for cooling, washing, and other things, uh, other needs. Are. Now, in rural Asia, it's mainly agricultural, okay, where uh, crops, livestock, and fish are produced. It, it uh, provides food and jobs and income to millions of our people. In uh, rural Asia, farms are usually small scale, maybe less than one hectare. And they're among the uh, poorest of the poor, resource poor. Okay? They depend mainly on what they can uh, produce or sell. But they consume also what they produce. 
80% of Asia's aquaculture farmers uh, are small scale. Let me uh, walk you through uh, freshwater aquaculture. Freshwater aquaculture is the farming of plants and animals. So if agriculture is farming on land of plants and animals, it's the counterpart of uh, food, uh, food production or farming of plants and animals in water as the medium. The only difference is that while you can see animals on land, you can see the fish underwater unless you, you go under or use a uh, you know, snorkel or dive. Um, Freshwater aquaculture is the main or the most important kind of aquaculture in Asia. Although you can have sea farming, like in Turkey, you raise sea bream uh, in cages in the sea, you know, sea bass. But in mainland Asia, it's mainly carps and tilapia, as well as in Pakistan and India, China and India. Okay. China is the biggest aquaculture producer in the world. You can also produce fish and other plants, aquatic plants, and even snails, you know, invertebrates, shrimps, or uh, prawns in tanks. But uh, this is not for the small scale farmer in Asia. It's mainly uh, earthen plants, okay? Like this lady you see here on the right, and this gentleman, I think, from Vietnam, using irrigation water or water from uh, rain, okay? The culture of freshwater feces, such as carps, like this grass carp at the uh, left, and most cor left hand corner, tilapia, the, the middle, and cut feces. Tilapia came from Africa and was introduced to Asia. Okay, but it's now second to carp globally. And I think more than 80 countries in the world. I just attended the meeting in Malaysia last week. And there are, I think, 180 countries growing tilapia. Okay. And it may soon take over or dominate world aquaculture in fresh water. Carps first, tilapia second, but in 20 years, uh, tilapia will overtake carps. So they are important for food security. I think many of us eat fish, and it is the cheapest source of protein, and it's also very healthy and nutritious. Those of you who like seafoods, I think, know that. Okay. okay, let's talk about sustainable freshwater aquaculture. When you talk about sustainability, you're talk thinking of the long term. So what does it take to be sustainable in aquaculture? First, you have to have clean and reliable water. Without water, you can't grow fish. Of course, in the desert, you can have date palms, you know, but you need water to survive there and to uh, allow your camels to have water. So we get water from the rain, but we know that with climate change, we have changes in uh, climatic patterns, you know, too much water in one area and no water at all. You get storms uh, uh, and uh, typhoons and so on. Irrigation. Yeah, we dump, we dump water to mountains, you know, and use that for irrigating our fields, but also for hydropower and uh, other uses. I think most of the water that we have is underground. Like, like when I was in Iran, I, I was, I was uh, amazed to know that they have a lot of ground, underground water. And they have a special way of tapping this, cons uh, conserving it, and uh, using it for their uh, needs. Second, the water must be available, accessible, and I'm sorry, <laughs> the inputs. Aside from water, you must have accessible, available, and affordable inputs for production, like fry or seeds. You must have fish fry, or we call it baby fish, to plant or to seed your plants. It's like agriculture, you, have, you need seeds. Then you need to feed it or fertilize the plant for natural food and other needs. We probably uh, can keep out pesticides here and insecticides, okay? Because in rural uh, aquaculture, we don't need so much of that, okay? Unless you go intensive farming like shrimps, but you get problems of diseases, and pollution, and so on, which I think uh, are not sustainable. Then thirdly, you must have something that people will consume or sell or be able to sell. Because if you don't like to eat it, why, take, why, uh, why farm it? 
Secondly, you cannot earn income unless you can sell your excess production. Okay? Because you need to also provide for your kids' education. You, have, you got to uh, uh, pay, uh, uh, have income for medicine, you know, and other things like transportation. So it's not enough to just produce food for your own needs. So what are the uh, systems of sustainable farming that are known or can be done? Well, multiple cropping or the practice of polyculture or composite fish farming in China and India has been done for centuries. This is where you have different species of carps that feed at the surface on plankton. Then on the second uh, part of the column, zooplankton, and the third level, you have the bottom feeders. So it's like multiple cropping, but the difference between agriculture and aquaculture is that aquaculture is a three-dimensional system. You can't put three cows on top of each other. You can't do that unless they hang. But you can stack more than one species of fish that don't uh, pile up on one another but float on top of each other because water is a three-dimensional system, okay? Not like terrestrial. Uh, uh, areas, okay? Now, the trouble with this uh, polyculture systems is that you have to spawn each species. Like the Indians have the Katla, the Mrigal, and uh, uh, the Rojo. But all of these have to be injected to spawn through hypothesization. You get the pituitary gland, uh, grind it, macerate it, and then inject it to the fish. That may not be applicable or appropriate for small-scale farmers in Asia. But why is it successful in China and uh, India? Well, traditionally, they have been doing it, and we have been trying to transfer this. But in most of Asia, like in the Philippines, we still spawn our fish naturally. We put male and female fish and let them breed like tilapia. And then uh, and that makes it accessible and affordable. You don't have to buy. You just spawn your own fish. In the case of the Indian and Chinese carps, there are hatcheries where the fry are sold to the farmers. So there is a one step there you know, that the farmers have to uh, contend with. Now, in a grass carp and Nile tilapia, it's a good system because you feed the grass carp grass. Grass grows everywhere where you have rain. Okay? And if you don't have cows, you can have a grass carp in a pond. Cut the grass, feed the grass to the grass carp, and the manure of the grass carp fertilizes the pond. You, didn't, you don't need chemical fertilizers. And you can have uh, a second species like the Nile tilapia, which is omnivorous or planktivorous, that can feed on the microorganisms that grow with the manuring of the pond with the, with the grass carp waste. So you get two crops, and you don't spend f f for feed and fertilizer for supporting the system. Okay, here is the concept of integrated farming in Asia. I don't have to explain all of this. I think this is quite uh, self-explanatory, but the pond is the focus, and all the waste goes there, from the cattle, even from the kitchen, and from the crop waste, and you have fish that grows in the pond and uh, feeds on the natural organisms that are propagated by your organic inputs. So it's also a way of conserving water, okay? So if you have rain harvesting, see, you have a deep pond, you can have fish, livestock, crops, in an integrated manner. So here are examples of integrated farming systems in Asia. On the upper uh, left hand side is rice fish farming. Now, uh, there are millions of hectares of irrigated rice and if we put fish like tilapia and carp in there, it helps control the pests of rice. It also manures the, the, the field. Of course, you don't use pesticides because it will kill the fish, but you get a second crop, fish. And in, and in, and in Indonesia, <laughs> there are one million hectares of irrigated rice fields producing baby fish that are providing protein to the children who are malnourished, the cheapest way, in two months, you stock the seed of the, of the carp, harvest them in two months that big, but then you can process it 
and they call it baby fish, and it's a good source of protein. You eat the whole thing, calcium, head, you know, uh, bones and all. Here, in the, uh, in, below that is the livestock, crop, and fish pan. The fish pan is uh, the background, three, three crops, livestock, cattle, vegetables, and fish. The manure of the cattle goes to the pan, okay? At the right hand, you see you have duck and fish, okay? So the ducks like, like water. When they go into the water and swim there, they defecate, fertilize the pond, and the tilapias and the carps get uh, fed with the natural food uh, produced by the waste. Then below this is chicken fish. The chickens are not swimming in the water, but the, the houses are above the water, and the droppings fall down, fertilize the pond. And it keeps the chickens cool, see, ventilated. Okay? Instead of keeping them in a, in a, in a in a house that's like a warehouse, you need fans, right? So, uh, so uh, above the water, there's it's cooler. Yeah. Now, in our own farm, uh, we have a little farm where I come from, Bai Laguna. We tried to do something about what we had and what we could afford. And here is the example of on-farm production of vermicompost. Vermicompost is the compost produced through vermiculture. Vermiculture is the farming of earthworms, vermi. Vermis in Latin means worms. So if you have organic ways, put the worms there, like the African night crawler, the uh, Eudridus eugenei, came again from Africa, but it, it's safe, it's not going to be a pest. You can produce two, two, uh, two things. You get fert organic fertilizer, vermicompost, see gathering the grass here, at the top of that. Then you harvest after 30 days, the fertilizer and the earthworm biomass that can replace fish meal in your fish diet. All from your farm. Fish meal is taken from the sea, like Peruvian fish meal. And I think fish should be fed to people, not to fish. It's more expensive, right? More nutritious. So far, nobody likes to eat earthworms, uh, but you can eat it if you like. It's clean <laughs> and safe, not, not like the parasites, you know, in your Testines, you know that, the scientists. Okay, but because the birds eat them, the frogs eat them, the fish eat them, and we eat the frogs, we eat the chickens, and we eat the fish. Why can't we eat the worms directly? Especially if we grow them with grass. Since we have no cattle in our farm, we only have earthworms to convert the grass to manure and to animal feed. So we raise tilapia, see this pond here, and we mix it with rice bran, the byproduct of uh, rice farming, and feed them to the fish, and we get this. It's economically and so technically feasible and sustainable. And if any of you wants a copy of this paper, I, I think I put it in my full abstract. I'm willing to do it. So with that, I say, there's a core at the rim, or I think uh, it means uh, tesic curler. Thank you, in. Sarkis, good night and good morning. <laughs>
in Iran, we imported in the last years tilapia, a lot of tilapia okay. from Philippines or other, because it is cheap. And many people, they wanted to use this kind of fish. But there is, it is said that because is from which tilapia country? is produced in non-conventional water, and it is the end of the process of the integrated water resources, so it seems it contains a lot of poisonous material. <laughs> and know the people in Iran, they, especially the educated people, they would, like, they would not like to use tilapia, but the poor people still use it. I want to know, do you uh, approve the quality of tilapia produced in the <laughs> Philippines or not? Uh, well, thank you for that question. Uh, the quality of tilapia in the world today is very, is very high. Okay, and uh, in some countries, uh, they export the, the fillet tilapia to the U.S., like, like Honduras, Ecuador, China. And you're right, food safety and uh, uh, residues are very important, just like in any food. And I assure you, the modern way of tilapia farming is uh, sustainable and responsible, and you can be assured of clean, no? No residues. Of course, you can use wastewater from industries, but you have to be careful of uh, beta heavy metals. But if you use domestic waste, okay, you're washing from the kitchen, and even uh, human urine, okay, it's safe. As long as there are no heavy metals and uh, me uh, pesticides, uh, maybe some residues of medicine, like birth control pills, the problem is that if this gets into the natural waters, it could affect the gender of some feces. The feces become females rather than, or hermaphrodites. This is true for the US, you know, they, they flush their toilets into uh, treatment plants and then, but the estrogens are not degraded. So it could affect natural species. So I hope it, uh, Iran will take a second look at tilapia because it's the second most important farm fish in the world today. And as I've said, in the meeting last week I had, I'm going to give you uh, the, the information that shows that quality of tilapia has improved a lot. Thank you. Yeah, because you grow tilapia in a farm which has a lot of uh, different substances. Why you don't use aquaculture for producing crop, not animal, not fish? I'm sorry, I can, I don't. You know, aquaculture is not only to produce fish yes. or animal. Yeah. You can have greenhouse using the okay. fresh water yeah. and they produce a lot of uh, vegetables. Yeah. yeah, water has many uses, but I'm saying is that if you have a fish pond, you're saving water, okay? Uh, then you can use uh, rice fish. You can combine fish farming with rice. That's another way of conserving water. So and then you can raise uh, three crops, livestock, fish, and plants, uh, livestock, crop, and fish, with, with the same water. Then if you have a fire, where do you go? So the fish pond and <laughs> put up the fire. In agriculture, you don't conserve water. You use water, it goes up to the air, to evaporation or underground. But if you have a reservoir, we say that put fish, because if you don't, mosquitoes will multiply. Okay. There's a Chinese saying, where there is water, there must be fish. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, from Nepal, oh. go ahead, please. <laughs> thank you. Uh, my question is, uh, in our country, the farmers, they have problem when they, you know, grow the uh, fish in the farms. And uh, most of them have problem that you know mo uh, all the fish will be die due to the eutroph eutrophication, uh, the growth of the algae uh, in presence of higher amount of phosphates. Do you have such type of problem here, or yes, uh, we, uh, we have a big lake uh, known as Laguna de Bae. It's about ninety thousand hectares, and we used to have eutrophication. Eutrophication is caused by Run off from agriculture fertilizers, like, like nitrates. So this 
triggers algal blooms, and when these algal blooms die, mm -hmm. uh, like uh, when there is no oxygen, they, they deplete the oxygen in the water and kill the fish. Mm -hmm. So we are able to regulate this by controlling pollution or the uh, runoff of fertilizers, that's one way. The other is to stock fish that will feed on the algae. Mm -hmm. So there are ways of doing I, I am familiar with your Lake, uh, your lake Pukara, is it Lake Pukara? And you have cages. So the, th the, the eutrophication comes from domestic sources, yeah. domestic waste, agriculture there. And uh, the way to control it is to really keep the pollutants from coming into the lake. Okay. And then put in fish that will feed on algae, mm -hmm. right? Maybe your native feces. I know you already are raising tilapia in Nepal. Thank you. Okay, thank you. From Bangladesh, go ahead, please. Yeah. Order. Yeah. Uh, thank you. There is a general opinion about the issue that uh, insecticides, if used in the rice field, kill fish. Yes, insecticide will kill fish, that is correct. But the question is, when pesticide, a particular pesticide is recommended for rice, it is tested for uh, susceptibility to fish also. When a fish scientist gives a recommendation, well, this pesticide is safe up to that level of concentration. Now, when this pesticide applied in the field, it further diluted with rainwater, further diluted with water in the river, whatever. Then the question is, then how does this further diluted pesticide affect fish production or others? If that is the case, then the question is, either the fish scientist did not test the pesticide properly, or uh, there was something wrong in the process of recommendation of pesticide. So if we say, don't apply pesticide in the rice field, well, we should reduce pesticide use, that's correct. We should make uh, the uh, judicial use of pesticide, that's correct. But you say that is very bad. Then question comes, the pesticide was not tested by the fisher scientist for some damage to fish. That's my comment. Okay. If possible, avoid the use of pesticides in rice fish. But if you're going to use pesticides, make sure you use safe pesticides. Uh, and residues should not be present in the fish when they are consumed by people. So this will take analysis, right? So earlier uh, in the Philippines, we, we tried to do this, but the problem was not that. The problem was that the farmers could not uh, cope with the additional work of watching the fish. They said, taking care of the rice is already too much work. If we put another animal there, <laughs> then we have no more time for other things. But that's a social problem. <laughs> in Indonesia, there's no problem like that. So we're trying to encourage our people to grow more uh, fish with rice because water is there. And we're running out of lakes for cage culture because we have limited water. See, so the expansion is there, but it, it's a social problem issue. <clears throat> the pesticide problem issue can be solved by residue analysis, by uh, using safer residues, uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> safer pesticides. Uh, but as I've said, with, with fish in the rice, it can help control the pests and add in the manjuring. You get additional 10% increase in your rice crop with the fish than without fish. Last question I will ask him. The, oh, thank you. If you go to the fish market <laughs> now in Turkey at least, that the, you can, of course, buy the same fish, uh, the natural uh, sea fish or culture fish. But the price is almost 50% uh, difference, you see. Uh, sea fish is very expensive. Yes. How about, is that the true same thing in Manila <laughs> or everywhere? I think that's true everywhere. People like sea fish better because they say it stays there. But mind you, it's a matter of cooking it. I didn't want to eat carps before, but when I tasted the carp in Indonesia, boy, I could eat everything, the bones, the head, and everything with ginger. Okay, so it's a matter of cooking and preparing it. I think the Asians are very good in preparing dishes, especially our women. Okay? But of course, when you go to the restaurant to celebrate your birthday, your wedding anniversary, baptism, you want to have special fish like red sea brim. Now you also have red tilapia, which is cheaper and delicious, uh, depending on how it's cooked. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> All right, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.
May I? May I? Uh, I have the pleasure to invite Isil Ezrin. Uh, yeah, please. <laughs> um, she is professor of uh, medicine, University of Public Health, and member of the National Biosecurity and Consultant Committee. Very briefly, because her long CV, I want to highlight that the, she has done most of her work in the public health. And many work, particularly genetically modified food and its tricks. And she started her career as medical practitioner and then came to the university, started research and teaching. She has many publications, and I don't want to read, and she is a distinguished. Many. Yeah, many. She has many publications, and she has a distinguished career in this area. I welcome her to make the presentation. Thank you. Uh, I would first of all would like to thank the organizing committee and also TUBA, ASA, and IAP uh, for this very important gathering. Uh, and it's very uh, great honor for me to be here and I thank you for this opportunity. Uh, my paper was in the afternoon actually, but uh, I think postponing the anxiety uh, would be worse, so I'd uh, prefer, uh, I preferred uh, to present it uh, with this program change. Uh, what I will present you now is uh, genetically modified organisms and risk perception. Uh, regarding risk perception, I want to not only assess how, per, uh, how risks are perceived, but, all, but also how benefits are perceived by the community. Uh, so, GMOs are considered an innovation, so we, would we need to first uh, think about is, is it an innovation. Uh, today's world is confronted with uh, new technologies every day and these innovations introduced change our way of living, our way of production and uh, they bring significant changes. When we say a technological uh, innovation, uh, we, we think that it must provide some benefits over what is currently available, uh, which may be lower costs, more functionality, or increased quality. Uh, so how about genetically modified organisms? Uh, they are considered an agricultural biotechnology products and the benefits declared by the industry are high efficiency, low need for pesticides, less environmental pollution, economic opportunity and a strategic technology for some countries and elimination of hunger. These are declared by the industry as the benefits. Uh, but we see that a number of key food markets, where we can example it as the EU and Japan, are uh, not too uh, sure, uh, not convinced about GM technology. And we see the GM-free areas uh, in 2010 of EU, uh, there is reluctance to embrace the technology. So we are sure that there are opposing views. So what do these opposing views say? Regardless of the industry's insistence on the benefits, uh, the evidence of risk are also on the agenda. And what the uh, so the called uh, risks are, there is the gene leakage. I will not talk uh, in detail about the uh, declared risks, but how these are perceived, I want to more concentrate on these. The emergence of resistant weeds or the super weeds, harms to biodiversity, pollutants, ethical issues, labeling problems, and of course, health effects. So, how about the Turkish communities uh, opposing uh, uh, views about this? In 2012, uh, there was this uh, interview and they said, we won't buy packaged food that are known to include GMO by 83%. 
and are you worried about GMOs was 81%. So the opposing views are the majority, we can say. Thus, for foods derived from biotechnology, the controversy between risk and benefits is a key issue in the uh, debate. When we say risk perception, uh, in any risk perception, we define our relationship with danger. So in the risk communication, there are parts to it, there are actors to it, and it, it's an interactive process. And between those at risk, those who evaluate risk, who are the regulatory bodies, the uh, government, the policymakers, and who manage risk is the industry, and all other actors may be in the view because uh, some environmentalists, uh, organizations uh, may be in the issue. Uh, industry, how is it positioned about risk and benefit? Uh, they are frustrated by the choices made by the public. Because it, uh, for, for, and for the industry, it has been important to understand why there is a position. Components of risk perception, the consumer acceptance, attitude, behavior, have stood out as important research areas. I have put out some um, studies, but there are uh, many uh, studies on uh, how consumers react uh, to it. They try to understand the issue. But when we talk only about risks, uh, industry and governmental institutions propose that benefits are not adequately conceived and risks are misunderstood. So they advocate providing more information to resolve objections. But if risk is misunderstood, is there a wrong judgment about risk? Or is the risk amplified? Or this assumption is constructed on the idea that there is complete agreement on the benefits. So is there such uh, agreement? We need to question that. Is this a merely a risk-benefit analysis? Or are there other components to this issue? So the Eurobarometer study, which is done in the EU, says there are many other issues than risk and benefit analysis. Uh, most opposers of GMOs are not against its use in medical applications, like the insulin or the hepatitis B vaccine. These are productions of biotechnology. So they point out to a rational approach for biotechnology for more restricted areas, which is medicine. Uh, so that means a specific opposition for GMOs. So when the information about risk is shared, the quantitative risk estimates say hazards, annual mortality rates, probabilities, life years, but people conceive risk more than that and they uh, think more, they don't think uh, about fatality numbers and estimate. People prefer to talk about it in terms of danger. And the potential problems include moral and democratic hazards, which means that when we talk about the issue, we need a broader perspective to uh, approach. So what are the major constructors of the opposition? We need to look at that. Uh, the ability to sense and avoid harm harmful environmental conditions is necessary for our survival and for all living things. But for human beings, there is something ex uh, extra to all other living organisms. It's that we change the environment to adapt to these risks. So this creates or reduces risk. Now, when we evaluate risk, Advanced technologies may be used to evaluate this, but what risk perception means to a lay person is that it's an intuitive assessment for the individual, which includes we need to go deep into sociology, politics, anthropology, and psychology. It's not only some advanced technology measuring how risky this is. So, Moreover, there are individual factors to the risk perception. There is age, gender,
cultural background, educational level, and also the political culture of the country also has a major effect on people's opinions. Because, for example, in the US and Canada, it's been measured, uh, uncertainty avoidance index, uh, they are not as strict about legislations, the community. But when we come to the Europe, they are less tolerant to social structure, a, a less tolerant so social structure exists for uncertainty. So this leads to a more strict regulations in the EU for a lot of other issues also, uh, and also regarding the GMOs. Also the political view of the individual is also important because considerations of the social and economic aspects of the increasing levels of ownership of the world's food resources by a handful of corporations may mean different things to, uh, to different political views. So risk perception studies, we, we need to look a bit closer to what these studies say. Uh, judgment people make when they are asked to characterize and evaluate hazardous activities. This, is, uh, uh, this has been studied, how people perceive risk. Psychometric paradigm uh, is a taxonomy developed for hazards to understand responses, and these are such cognitive maps. I'll show you this. Uh, yes. Here you see the DNA technology. This is in 1985, much before the GMO technology was largely distributed in the world. But you see DNA technology as a highly perceived as an unknown risk and highly perceived as a dread risk. When you look at its position, it's near uh, nuclear reactor actor, uh, accidents or uh, radioactive wastes very high risk perceived for them in 1985. So when we look at what dread risk means and what unknown risk means to lay persons, it's unthinkable, un involuntarily constructed, uncontrollable, poses hazards for future generations, consequences fatal, non-equitable, and not easily reduced. The authors of the uh, Slovich has uh, defined dread risk as this, an unknown risk, not observable, effect delayed, new source of risk, incompletely understood by laypersons, and risks unknown to science. So we have another map, and similar where, where it's located, we see that the larger the point, the greater the desire for strict regulation. So we see th in this area the need for more of the society for more strict regulations. The, this is in 1985, but we see that not much has changed about this and something's more added to the issue because another scientist, Sjöberg, has added to the evaluation interfering with nature, unna uh, apart from dread risk and unknown risk, we have unnatural, immoral futures. And Sjögrist, another scientist, has added for biotechnology a trust issue. So what, does, what do we mean by trust? Trust is the... Uh, we have the expert view, we have the layperson view. And the gap in between this is this deep gap. There is deep gap for the GMOs. Uh, the trust or mistrust for regulatory authorities, policymakers, scientists, and industry. The mistrust for these actors. So uh, this. Uh, the trust in those who have control over the future development of the technology is important. People want to have control over decision making. Studies have shown this. So ensuring greater democratization of decision making may reestablish trust in authorities. People want this. They want to be in decision making processes. So. Only accurate risk information, dissemination of this, is not a solution for this trust. We need to involve laypersons, the community, into decision-making studies show that. And there are the role of emotions. 
an expression of already existing values and preferences. So contrary to the understanding that every new technology is based on a rational choice on basis of independent assessment of risk and benefit, this is not the case. People have emotions about their preferences. So this is another component. And when we look at, again, to Eurobarometer study of EU on perceptions of benefits, we have one more uh, important point to make there. A uh, Eurobarometer study has evaluated biotechnology applications considering genetic testing, cloning human cells, cloning animals, environmental remediations, GM medicine, crops and food. And the response have been taking on four parameters, benefit, risk, morally acceptance, and overall support. And what we see in here are there are those who find it useful and risky, which we named as, as trade-offs, those who find it useful and not risky, the relaxed, and those who find it skeptical, not useful, and risky, and the uninterested group, not useful and not risky. I will not go in deep into the, uh, this, but we, when we uh, consider the features of these groups, the study has looked at the technical optimism, scientific knowledge background, trust, gender, and education issues, and they have evaluated who are more enthusiastic to support GMOs. They are those who are optimistic about new technologies, trust in the actors of the food chain, more educated, and men. Uh, these groups are more enthusiastic to support. But we need to, this study also focuses on another critical assessment. As benefit perception increases, the effect of risk perception, as uh, benefit perception increases, the effect of risk perception is intensified. That means that what people uh, risk perception is led by the benefit perception. If people consider it beneficial, then they go on thinking about whether it's risky or not. But if they don't find it beneficial, they don't regard a risk evaluation. So finding it beneficial or not is a critical point. And when we look at GMOs, people are not convinced that they are beneficial. So the uncertainty and fear for GMOs is not restricted to knowledge deficit, but it encompasses the scientific uncertainties inherent within the technology. So it's framed by social, cultural, and political engagement of those whose views are considered. Not convinced with the claimed benefits, the mistrust to food change actors, and the inability to control the decision-making processes all strengthen the opponents to GMOs, which are considered to include moral and democratic hazards as well. And I would like to add one more information about a very recent uh, assessment that on 22nd of March, uh, IARC, which is the very top organization for cancer and risks about cancer of World Health Organization has de declared glyphosate as a group 2A carcinogen. This is a very important uh, development, a very important declaration. Glyphosate is the major herbicide of GMOs and is a very largely consumed uh, used uh, herbicide. So, uh, DDT, which is only a 2B, group 2B carcinogen, is restricted, is banned in many countries. So, what uh, Mr. Kahl, uh, Mr. Lal has said that uh, Academy has the responsibility to use information and advice for policymakers. So what, what is now very urgent is that Academy produces some feedback to policymakers that glyphosate should be banned urgently. So I think this international very valuable uh, gathering may be a good opportunity to talk about this and declare 
something to say about glyphosate, this very new information uh, that is very relevant to food security. I would like to thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you. I have uh, two, three observations. One is that GMOs uh, are very emotional issues. Really? Very emotional issues. Mm -hmm. It is within this kind of gathering we can come to an agreement without difficulty because our method of science is common to all of us. Uh -huh. If uh, you say a negative impact, we always know there must be a study, a proof, and a legitimate uh, evidence which is peer-reviewed and all that. Within this, there is no problem. Problem is between the common people and political level uh, people, I can tell you from uh, a experience we had, I once had to lead a uh, six uh, academies in India to a parliamentary uh, advisory board where they were, um, uh, we had to defend uh, that uh, we should not uh, blanket, give a blanket ban we should evaluate and so on. It was very, it was supposed to be half an hour affair, but it went up to three hours. Because we were very polite, but we were not yielding. Uh, in the sense that science has taught us that our decisions are based on properly conducted research and peer-reviewed results which are internationally published. And yes. for example, many, uh, some of the parliamentary unions ask, it will destroy the soil. I said, this is a very strong comment. We would like to see your evidence on what basis you see. He said, I have read somewhere. I said, that is where science differs. Okay. You have read somewhere means nothing to us. You have to give a reference. Now, coming more, I let me say one more. There are all related. The, among the academy uh, groups or regional networks, the European network, European network, ESAG, has been very active in this. Though Europe is one of the uh, regions which does not uh, approve of GMOs to that extent, they have a recent report, Isaac has published, including the BT cotton. And there is a whole, there was a whole, why I got involved, I'm a physicist, I am not in this field, whole chapter on India's experience on BT cotton. BT cotton in India made one difference. India was a cotton importing country. Now it is a cotton exporting country. So they had such data, and they sent one chapter to me for getting it reviewed before it is published. Now it is published. So what I, my suggestion, all this background is, we should now, within ASA domain, prepare a scientifically high quality report on experience in our ASA region, like Isaac did. So they had evidence even from India, whole chapter, some papers, even our fellowship, they found from Indian journals, uh, which were not yet into the SCI journals and so on. But the data was very good, and they could evaluate and put it there. So for us, the challenge with ASA is we should produce such reports which are intellectually very satisfying, but which at least will tell the decision makers and some intelligent uh, viewers. We, for example, once had a panel discussion open to public in our academy, a public discussion on our National Science Day. A lot of discussion was there, but uh, what we thought was one hour, but we allowed it to go for two, two and a half hours. So this is our duty to educate them, but also produce good literature. So I would like to know your comments on that. Uh, 
thank you for your comments. Uh, says that the paper was not about the risks of GMOs. Uh, if I have written uh, a review about those risks, but this was not the issue of this because I tried to understand how people perceive risk and benefit and I uh, tried to summarize what I've read about uh, this in uh, GMO uh, risk perception. Uh, I disagree with one point, agree with another point in what you have commented. Uh, my agreement uh, on uh, what you have said about uh, producing uh, literal uh, scientific data, of course, is very important. Uh, and uh, we need to produce information locally, not the European perspective, but what is going on in our countries, as the Asia or uh, the other part of the world, apart from Europe. I very much agree with that. What I disagree is that I don't think this is an emotional issue. Uh, and uh, regard uh, uh, what uh, the issue about GMOs, yes, has not come to a real vivid scientific proof that it is uh, carcinogenic to people or uh, th there is no such end to it. But studies are going on and I do agree that we need to contribute to what's this scientific uh, debate. Uh, but this is not an emotional issue as there has been some proofs in rats and other uh, animal studies that we should evaluate as scientific. So we should go on about these uh, proofs and build some more information on these. But about what I said in the, at the very end about glyphosate. Glyphosate has been proven and it's said that what 2A, group 2A means that it's a probable carcinogen in humans. What group 2A means is that, and this is more than DDT. DDT is group 2B. So information, scientific information about glyphosate is higher than this. So uh, I'm not saying that we should come to uh, agreement on GMOs. That's not just for the scientific society yet. But if glyphosate has been declared as a group 2A carcinogen, then there is something to do about it. That's what I'm saying at the very end. The Iqbal from Pakistan. After the Iqbal from Pakistan, then Hamid Bey. Uh, yes, uh, Dr. Ishal has very rightly pointed out that there is a knowledge gap uh, between research on GMOs and its uh, approval for general use. Uh, I think uh, there have not been conducted long-term experiments on GMOs, let's say for 20 or 30 years, by feeding genetically modified organism food to certain type of people uh, for extended period of time and to see what effects they will have uh, on their normal functioning and uh, on their further generation or progeny. So uh, I think day before yesterday in Pakistan, the Minister for Climate Change, you know we have a separate ministry for climate change. Uh, he also issued a statement that the GMO foods have been linked uh, indirectly or directly with cancer cases. And even to some deaths have been reported uh, as a result of uh, these uh, type of foods. So he also stressed that there should be uh, extended research uh, on this topic before any final verdict is issued uh, in its favor or against it. So I, I fully support uh, your view that there is knowledge gap and that there should be uh, long-term research on GMOs. You can have a response, a quick response. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah, Dr. Hamid Yeah, thank you. GMO is a very controversial issue. 
in favor of gmo there are plenty of research but against gmo rather the ben uh, bad effects of gmo i doubt very much whether there is sufficient data and many of the people who are half informed or misinformed they tend to say it is dangerous carcinogenic and what not about 15 years ago there is a news in the paper some rats died through eating potato the news was there but they did not disclose that the rats were fed raw potato and uh, rats do not like raw potato for eating so that died due to starvation not due to gmo food so this sort of wrong propaganda was there in the air and also i can tell you in my country there are some group of people talking about gmo also they are talking about hybrid rice they tend to say hybrid rice is bad for health the international rice institute invited that gentleman well you come to iri you convince us how hybrid rice is bad for health or you convince us so that we stop hybrid rice anymore but he did not respond so it's just, as he said this is a sentimental issue and i think there should be a sort, sort of joint um, communication from this sort of rajdar forum that unless you have concrete data information against the gmo for health or whatever please don't publicize all this rubbish thing because we need food we need food security and nutrient security uh, i will again say that this was not about gmo risk uh, debate so uh, it's how it's perceived but if we need another extra uh, information i can give some scientific yeah. information on how gmo risk is uh, proven or not proven but uh, shown in some um, animal studies uh, written in scientifically very impact factor high papers journals Yes, please. That was the last. Thank you very much for your talk. You showed some uh, papers, scientific paper from different journals. Unfortunately, these days you can't publish any reports or scientific uh, paper with synthetic data by paying money. Uh, so you cannot trust to all of them. Anyway. During uh, last years, Iran has imported rice from some countries that some of them were genetically manip manipulated, especially from India. But our investigation proved that these type of rices uh, have not been exported to countries like UK, Germany, or European countries, only to the developed countries, only to developed countries, underdeveloped countries. Uh, you know, I want, as an expert, I would like to ask you, uh, you know, a lady who is pregnant, do you recommend here to use genetically manipulated rice during her pregnancy? Because lay people, they see that the rice is, has the same shape as the others. And he, she doesn't know whether it is okay or not. Mm -hmm. I think, uh, uh, you know, we have to be very careful, uh, even with the scientific reports, mm -hmm. uh, until, you know, it is scientifically mm -hmm. proved that they are okay. Mm -hmm. uh, I wanted to ask you that, do you use uh, or recommend using this type of rice or any food to the ladies who are pregnant? Uh, not only pregnant, actually I tried not to uh, project my point of view uh, into this uh, presentation, but I am an opponent of GMO. <laughs> And, uh, but I, tr I tried not to put this into this paper because I, I wanted to show what risk and benefit and how people perceive it. But I, not only pregnant, I don't want to be, it to be consumed by children. I don't want it to be consumed by anybody, any human being. And I don't want it to be uh, put it into environment. 
I want it to, to be banned. But things don't work out this way scientifically. As you said, what makes it, it uh, what makes my uh, opinion a credible one is that I try to stay and look at the observations and the evaluations uh, with a scientific approach. Are they credible? Are they published in papers that have very strict rules and very scientific evaluations? Uh, but uh, as you said, in these days, publishing something may not, may be uh, containing some other uh, factors involved. But we need to be convinced with evidence that has good sampling, good methodology, good presentation. Uh, so we have some stages of science that we need to admit as scientific. And as a public health spe specialist and as an epidemiologist, I look at papers. When I read a paper, I look at its sample, I look at its observations. Are they biased or not? And I then present it as a scientific evaluation. So I try to be specific about what I present here. I, I'm sorry if, I, if those seem to you as some, some papers, but those were the very famous papers on risk perception on GMOs. So uh, I tried to be specific <laughs> and credible on the Thank issue you. on the papers. Yeah.